everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here with another episode of the Wayne Public Library Virtual Jazz Series, and I have the great pleasure and honor today to be chatting with drummer John DeFiori. So thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So part of my program is to uh, connect and um, learn from many of the musicians who have an affiliation with William Patterson. So let's start there. I understand that you attended there for your master's in music, and then you're also a professor. You want to talk a little bit about that? I got my master's in music from William Patterson. While I was there, I studied composition um, with Kevin Norton, um, <clears throat> amongst the many other classes uh, that went with that program. I was there the final years of Mulgrew Miller's reign as the director of that program. Unfortunately, he passed away the summer right after I finished and graduated. So I feel very fortunate to have been in some of his last classes. He was a really powerful uh, and humble figure there. And I've always, you know, continued to be connected with William Patterson in some way. I've worked alongside Dave Dempsey and Tim Newman um, running the jazz workshop, the summer jazz workshop, uh, since I was a student there in 2012 up to the, you know, current summer. We just finished it a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, continuing those connections and and working with them. Eventually, I started teaching as an adjunct there as well. I teach a course called um, Jazz History, Literature, and Repertoire for Music Educators. Um, it's a graduate course. Uh, I started doing that, I think, two years ago. And did you always want to be a drummer? I had read in your biography that you are not formally trained. Um, you have uncles who are drummers, and they, you seem to have uh, some sort of drumsticks, whether it was wooden spoons or something in your hands from the time you were about four. Yeah, my mom's father and her brother, uh, both drummers. So growing up, whenever I would visit my grandfather or my uncle, there'd be a drum set set up. And I, you know, really gravitated towards it as a kid. And then I think about four years old or five years old, I've asked people in my family, no one can seem to give me a button time that it happened. But around that time period, they bought me like a little, you know, not toy drum set, but small drum set. And it just always piqued my interest. I just always gravitated towards it. And um, I didn't take drum lessons growing up. I, I listened to a lot of recordings and replicated what I was playing. My uncle, my grandfather were also not formally trained drummers. So they would show me, you know, what they knew how to play on the drums. And uh, and um, I just continued to do that and do that. And then when I got into high school, fortunately, I went to a school that had a really great music program. And um, I got to play in a lot of ensembles there. And that gave me a, a lot of experience. And then when I went to college um, was the first time I started taking real formal, like weekly drum lessons with a teacher uh, who was Tim Horner, who was a fantastic teacher, and, you know, a great person that kind of helped rein in all this stuff I knew how to do on the drums and kind of give me a, you know, a pathway to take it all, which was which was great. Did you ever want to play any other instrument or were you encouraged to pursue something like piano or uh, another instrument where you would uh, be reading music or learning how to read music? I play piano as well. Um, I think that's that came from me just understanding that if you want to get music from all the angles, you have to understand the melody and the harmony of it as well. And that's something that, you know, you can't really do on the drums. I mean, you could be a part of that in the in the band, in the music and help guide where it goes, but you can't really contribute, actually contribute to the harmony or the melody. So I think my senior year of high school, when I realized I was going to go to school for music, I uh, asked the choral teacher at my high school if he would help show me some piano stuff because he played piano as well. And he did. He kind of showed me the fingerings for my scales and how to play, you know, simple chord progressions and stuff, the things I would need to know for the exams that I was going to take to get into college. And that's when my, like, I guess you could say my formal, you know, piano studying happened. And then throughout college, I, I studied piano in the programs, you know, that I was in as a requirement. It probably was easy for you to transition into learning piano at a, it sounds like a slightly lighter, um, older age. And it, because playing drums, you're using both hands and your feet, you know, it's multitasking and it's, and it's ultimate. So playing piano, and having to play two hands is probably an easier transition. It was and it wasn't. You know, the the uh, syncopation that you need in your limbs that comes from drumming does also 
work in some ways with piano, but with drumming, it's just one stick and one stick, but piano, you have five fingers. So yeah, it was a lot of hours of like getting that coordination together. Yeah, it was not easy. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier about um, talking about harmony and one of the things that I had read was you um, had said that learning about harmony informed your drumming and I'm curious how that happens. Yeah, so in the jazz context, I mean, this works in a lot of styles of music, all of them you can argue, but you know, I come mostly from the jazz perspective. Um, the musical conversation that's happening, there's a lot of tension and release that happens within the harmony um, and the melody of the music and the energy that the drums can contribute to that music can mirror right the the tension and release and the energy that comes from the harmony of the music so as i started to understand more about harmony and my ears started to hear more of those tension and release points in music i was able to react better for, as a drummer in those scenarios and um yeah i would say that's how it informed my drumming for sure does it influence your composition as well oh absolutely yeah absolutely um yeah, I mean, harmony is one of the fundamental, you know, pillars of how music works. So um, if you can understand it, listening to it, then there's no way it's not going to influence then what you put out, you know, moving forward. Are you influenced by any of the jazz rockers? Um, to, what comes to mind specifically is Keith Moon, because in many of the documentaries I've seen it, about his playing, is that he played in such a way that he was interacting with uh, John Entwistle on the bass and but also with Pete Townsend on guitar and and weaving his rhythms almost in a different way than a drummer normally does. Would you be able to explain that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think Keith Moon, drummers like Keith Moon, Ginger Baker is another one that comes to mind. Um, Mitch Mitchell with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, those kinds of drummers obviously had a jazz influence to their playing. I know that Ginger Baker had records he made, you know, at points in his career that are very jazz oriented. Um, and yeah, I don't, I love that music. I grew up listening to that music. You know, my parents were born in the sixties. So I grew up in a house with Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and the Beatles and bon, um, Billy Idol and, you know, Madonna and all, you know, Elton John great, great music to grow up around. So I listened to all of that stuff. Absolutely. There's no way I don't think it could have not influenced me. Um, I like listening to Jimi Hendrix, you know, some of those live recordings with his trio. It's awesome music. I really enjoy it. I think the biggest rock drummer that left an influence on me, I don't know if you would say he's on the jazzier side, definitely maybe a bluesier side is John Bonham from Led Zeppelin. I was introduced to his drumming really young and it captivated me. And I, you know, I had a period of of my life for a long time all through my teenage years where I just wanted to sound like John Bonham so yeah he was a huge influence on me how about Bill Bruford was he an influence with, on you because of his the progressive rock and then also with King, King Crimson and yes and he also has a very big jazz influence on his playing not really I mean I know of him now in you know where I'm at now when I was younger and and coming up like with all those groups I mentioned, those bands weren't on my radar. I didn't really learn about those bands till I got into college. Um, so I, I, not really. Bill, I mean, I respect Bill Bruford's drummer. He's a great drummer. Now I hear it, but uh, but no, not someone that I would say I put in my you know toolbox of drummers I pull from. So one of the things I'd like to talk about is about a drummer's drum kit. And is there a different configuration that you would um, put together for if you're playing in your trio or if you're playing as a sideman in a, a different group? And are there specific drums or cymbals that you prefer to use to expand your kit? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I can get into the geary side of things just for those who are listening and want to hear it. Uh, my like go-to setup, if I'm playing in a small group or my trio, you know, I like to use two ride cymbals and hi-hats and then two tom-toms, a rack tom, a floor tom, bass drum and a snare drum. I tend to use drums that are smaller and higher pitch. I have a 16 inch bass drum. I also like to use an 18 inch bass drum. Um, I will expand on that setup if I'm playing with a big band in the sense that I may 
use my 18 inch bass drum and tune it a little bit lower to get a little bit more of a punch. It kind of fits in that texture of the music a bit better. And I will sometimes add another cymbal that's a little darker um, with some sizzles and stuff in it. That's a very common thing to do. I mean, I'm a huge Mel Lewis fan. I kind of like idolize him when it comes to big band drumming or use him as an idol rather when I look at big band drumming. So that kind of sound. Um, now I play with some groups. I play regularly with a group called Sleeper Shell that is a little bit more progressive rockish fusiony, and I use a whole different drum set for that. I have a drum kit that's you know tuned uh, fatter, rounder. I use um, hydraulic heads, and I use like a china cymbal and a ride and a crash that has some holes in it, like an ozone crash. It gives it a really trashy sound and bigger hi hats. So yeah, I definitely will change my setup depending on which group I'm playing with. But I have a core sound and setup that I like to use and try to just build off of. It's interesting that you mentioned Mel Lewis because um, recently I had the great pleasure of uh, interviewing Bill Crow. And so we were talking about the fact that Mel Lewis would uh, configure his drum to have the tune um, uh, match the bass um, to a lower end. Um, that was, it was interesting to me because I hadn't really thought about that. And he made the point that, um, Bill Crow made the point that a lot of drummers that he's, uh, known, uh, more recently seem to have smaller drum, uh, bass drums, and it could be for the ease of carrying and transport. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I learned a few years ago that the reason why Roy Haynes used a shorter dimension drum bass drum was because he had Ludwig custom make it for him so it could fit in the trunk of, you know, he liked to drive sports cars that notoriously had small trunks. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's funny when you find those things out, like here I am, I'm such a Roy Haynes nut. And I realized that he played shallower bass drums, you know, it's, and it's like, oh man, I want to get a drum like that. And like, and then you find out why, you know, it wasn't necessarily about the sound. I mean, look, I'm not going to speak for Roy Haynes. I, I would never do that. He's the, he's the king. Right. But uh, that's what I've heard that that's why he had a smaller bass drum. So. so this is a pedestrian question, uh, but can you take a smaller bass drum and, and tune it so that it has a larger sound? To a there's a limit on it, but yes, you can, um, depending on how thick of a head you use, how loose you make the heads. You know, if you use a, any kind of muffling on it, it tends to allow you to get a rounder sound at a lower pitch. Um, so yes, you can, but you're not going to get a small 16-inch bass drum with really loose heads to sound like a John Bottom 24-inch bass drum. It's just not, you know, there's a limit there, but yeah, you could. You could. So is there a part of you that wants to let your, like, inner Neil Peart just kind of go crazy and let it out and just get the biggest drum kit you could possibly ever have. When I was like 17 years old, I played on a drum set that had a lot of stuff on it. That was my, I did it for a few years and then I, I got rid of it all. I sold it all. But um, yeah, there was a period where I had a lot of stuff growing up. I was, I was really into the drummer Carter Buford from Dave Matthews band. And he was like a percussionist and a drummer all in one. So he had a lot of gadgets on his drum set that I would often like to use too. So you had mentioned too about having a certain tone um, and setting up your kit. So there's an interview um, from um, or Eric Ford of the London Jazz News. He wrote a review of your Yellow Petal CD. And I just want to read what he wrote here is that your album has a mid 60s Rudy, Rudy Van Gelder aura about it, thanks to the warmth of the sound, the sound of the drums, like Gretsch drums from that era with the tuning you'd expect to hear on those recordings and symbols, e.g. the fame, infamous Tony Williams ride. Can you expand on that a little bit of what he's describing? That reviewer nailed it on the head. I remember reading that, you know, a while back when that review was written because I recorded on Gretsch drums, number one. So he nailed it. And um, I, on that recording, used a K Constantinople, 22 inch K Constantinople, which, yes, I was trying to capture a little bit of that Tony Williams old K sound, which has become somewhat of an iconic cymbal sound. There are a lot of people that are trying to make cymbals that sound like it, you know, companies that try and replicate that older, warmer, very sticky, um, but has some wash to it, Tony Williams sound. There are some really great videos of Tony playing with Miles's band. A lot of them are overseas, concerts from overseas, where he's playing those old case. You can really see what they looked like. And they tended to be, you know, kind of bigger, 
washier but really defined symbols and that became a became a thing if you had um your your dream kit what what would you do with it now like what would be my dream kit if i could have one oh man well this goes two ways i mean I, there is a kind of coveted drum set that primarily were made like i believe in the 1950s um gretsch's round badge kits which if you can find one of those they're you know known to be some of the more well-made better sounding you know drum kits there are a lot of drummers especially like a lot of the blue note drummers that played on those drums and a lot of those recordings in the 50s um so that's a very iconic sound in drums so i would love a set of those however growing up my grandfather had a rogers a champagne sparkle rogers drum kit that you know just for sentimental reasons i would love i believe he bought it like in the 1940s or something so it's like of that era um i could be wrong about that i, I don't really know all the details uh you know i would i would also love to have that kind of kit too for the sentimentality of it and i know they would sound great right if i could get a drum kit from that era and if yeah if i could have a set of old k's you know um, like I talk about the coveted, you know, Constantinople symbols that were made in Turkey in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, I would, I would love that. So I'm just thinking, um, here when you're talking about the old recordings and the old, you know, they from jazz heyday, if you will, when you had those studios and I'm not sure, um, I'm just thinking out of the box here. Do you know if those studios had their own drum set there or did every drummer bring in their own kit? don't know if I know the answer to that. I mean, I've seen pictures of those recording sessions, right? I think Francis Wolf like has some incredible photos from a lot of those old sessions. And there are different drum sets in those sessions, I believe. It's a good question. I'm going to go back and look at some of those pictures. You, you, you've you uh, put something back here for me to look into. I would like to think that they brought their own drums. I mean, one of the reasons why I say that is because if you listen to a recording that Roy Haynes is on, it sounds like Roy Haynes. I mean, I understand that these, you know, incredible drummers can make themselves sound like themselves on anyone's drum set, but also they had their their tunings and their things that they use, their drums that you can tell were theirs. Um, you know, Elvin's drums always sounded like Elvin's drums. So I would, I would think that they probably brought their own drum sets, although I wouldn't be surprised if if like Rudy Van Gelder's studio had a house drum set that a lot of drummers opted to use, I'm not really sure about that. It's a great question. I'm kind of curious about it because I know with bassists, they, they, I've spoken to several and they've said that they've tried to use other other bassists, especially if they're traveling, you know, and that it's it, it sounds so different uh, or it feels different based on the strings and, and the makeup of that particular bass. And each bassist has their own voice with their bass. So it, it just had me thinking a little bit there. That's a that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. I'm gonna find out. I'll know the answer next time I see you. I'm gonna look it up. Hey, maybe you could ask a librarian. She could find that yeah. out for you. Yeah. So let's um, talk a little bit about your CDs and uh, your first, um, your debut was Patience. And that yeah. came out in 2012 and that's a mix ensemble uh, featuring Rich Perry and trumpeter Joe Magnarelli. Um, Rich Perry, as we were talking before we started here, is um, the gentleman who performed with Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, right? Yeah, he was in um, he was in Mel's band. You know, I I'm not 100 percent sure if he played with Thad. I know he definitely played in Mel's band. I know that there was a period where Thad left that group and Mel took it over. So. I'm, I, I'd have to ask Rich, honestly, exactly when all that lined up. Um, but yes, he played in Mel Lewis's band and continues to play with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, which is what that band has turned into. So this is a nice little segue to mention, too, earlier this year um, in the spring, uh, William Patterson, uh, during this uh, Jazz Room series, then had the uh, workshop faculty uh, perform. And I've always, always told uh, David Dempsey and Pete McGinnis that the faculty should perform every single Jazz Room series because the amount of talent that is on staff is astronomical. And I think more and more people need to know um, and hear the playing as, of the people behind the scenes, if you will. So that was on uh, July 17th. So that was the Summer Jazz Room series. And that was the 30th anniversary of the Summer Jazz Room, which is kind of amazing how long that's been going on. And that um, configuration included Tim Newman on trombone, David Dempsey on saxophone, Mike LaDon 
on piano, Marcus McLaurin in on bass, and of course yourself on drums. It I was there. It was fantastic. I enjoyed it. What was it like for you? Well, I mean, to get to play with those, you know, performers is always a, a privilege and a and a and a great experience. I mean, I've you know. I've known Marcus and Dr. Dempsey and, uh, you know, Dr. Newman for a long time. Um, Michael Don is someone I've known more recently, you know, uh, but he's, you know, obviously the powerhouse that he is and everyone else on stage. So I had a blast playing that concert. Uh, I'm really grateful that I was included in it. And he, I mean, I don't know what else to say, it's, you know, uh, those are the kind of gigs that you look forward to for sure. So something I've asked pianists and uh, bassists is about the relationship of the rhythm section. And as a drummer, how do you form or how do you uh, facilitate those relationships with the uh, keyboards and with the bass? The rhythm section has a large responsibility, like the macro way to look at it is we have the responsibility of you know, setting a vibe and creating the time and, you know, moving the music and the harmonic movement and all of that. But then within that, there's relationships of how the drums work with the bass, how the bass works with the drums, how the piano works with the bass, you know, how the piano works with the drums, all of that. And, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a can at times be a juggling act because you have to maintain a feeling and a time, uh, with the bassist, end with the comping patterns of the piano, but at the same time, you want to contribute to the conversation that's happening with say a horn player that may be in front of you, or if it's just a trio, you know, whatever the pianist is playing in the right hand versus what the pianist is playing in the left hand. So um, as far as maintaining relationships, you want to, you know, maintain a focused sound and feeling with the bass and a time consistency. Um, and also have that leeway to move the time places if the music calls for it, if the energy goes in a certain direction. Um, but at the same time, be able to hear some of the other contributions that are coming in from the outside uh, and and add into that, into that connection as well. So a question I've asked other interviewees is, as a... Um, what is the responsibility of the musician then, whatever uh, instrument you're playing is, if it's your own trio, are you driving that train then on how you want the sound and the rhythm to go? Or if you're a sideman in, a, in someone else's band, how does, what is your responsibility that you bring to the plate? When I work as a sideman, if I'm playing someone else's original music, then I'm going to try to make sure what I'm playing fits the goal of the person that composed it. Um, to give you an example. I had a rehearsal not that long ago. This very good saxophone player friend of mine wrote this piece and we started playing it and I heard what the bass line was. It was, you know, it had a very kind of tribally, um, almost African is the way I heard it. And so I started playing a certain vibe over. And after a little while, we stopped because something was going on in the music. And then he came over to me and talked about thinking of it more like a Irish jig in the sense of having this a different kind of rolling rhythm. And as soon as we started playing it again, and I thought of it more like that, things started to click, right? So you have to have like that... Um, I'm going to use the word willingness for lack of a better word that I can't think of at the moment, but to just kind of succumb to that. I don't want to say succumb because that's not, that, that takes away creativity in a way. Um, but to, to have that ability to sit in what the music needs at that time. Um, but then when I lead my own groups, I'm on the other side of that. Right. So now I'm hearing things in my head when I wrote the music that sometimes I would like the band to do. But for the most part, I'm a firm believer of giving the other musicians in the group the freedom. Like I, I have those members in my group because I like the way they play. So I'm going to allow them play the way they play, you know, uh, unless there's something that conflicts with the idea that I want the music to create. Then maybe I'll step in and say, actually, you know, pedal here. Don't don't move the harmony because it's supposed to be a pedal point, you know, something like that. So, uh, yeah. So you just answered the, my next question. So you're a little bit prescient there. I was going to say with your own compositions, 
it, it does appear that you're comfortable with giving the bassist and the pianist a kind of freedom to explore and, and a room for interplay. And um, specifically, I'm thinking of the song Orange um, that you composed. Um, and I love the time to signature on that. And I have to admit, it took me a little bit of, of thinking there to finally get in. I, I believe it's 6-8 time, Riz. Yes, it's, yeah, you can think of it like that, absolutely. You can think of it a few different ways. It's built off of a Brazilian rhythm um, that is kind of thought of as like a big rolling, um, like 12 feel. But yeah, 6-8 fits in that for sure. Now, do you enjoy different time signatures? Yeah, I think as a percussionist and drummer, we're exposed to a lot of music that is in different time signatures. I don't know. I just, I've always found that my percussionist friends gravitate to the, that sort of stuff. You know, I've, I've studied in percussion ensembles as well when I was in school and stuff like that. And there was always modern, you know, stuff in there and, and, and you know, it's there. But the other thing that is interesting too, is when you start to look at music from other cultures, Eastern European cultures, um, African music to an extent, not, not necessarily an odd time signature, but the way they break up the beat is very different than, you know, kind of some European music. Uh, you start to see that there are areas of the world where odd, what we consider odd time signatures is the norm for them. So uh, that, that was always intriguing to me too. So when you're composing then, is there, uh, what is the first instinct that you have when you start your composition? Are you thinking, okay, I wanted it to be in this time signature, or I want to think about this specific theme, or I want it to be, uh, have the feel of a wall. It's like, where, how do you go about uh, your compositions? A lot of my compositions stem from something. Uh, like what I mean, I know that's a big, but what I mean is like a, maybe an experience I had in my life or a person, I've written a lot of music for people. Uh, there's usually some kind of like emotional driving factor. And I'll give you an example, right? So last fall, um, I lost my grandmother who was like a huge person for me in my life. She was an immigrant from Italy. And I wrote a piece of music for her that was very simple and very happy sounding because that's who she was. So there are usually factors that will kind of guide you in a direction for what it is that you want to write. But then there are times where I'll hear something. I'll hear a piece of music written by someone else that I'm like, whoa, what a concept, right? So then you mull on that concept. You figure out what it is and then you, and then you, you don't take what they did because, you know, obviously that would be stealing, but maybe there's a, 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 a bigger idea that they pulled from that you can also pull from and then create out of as well. So it comes from, it comes from different places, but I, I wouldn't say that I write music like as I know that I've tried to do this. I, it has been successful in some, some times. And I know other people do this Well, they'll, they'll write almost like for exercise, right? Like they'll, they'll, and from that, they will then be able to come up with something creative. Right. But um, I, I've found that that hasn't necessarily worked for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm not doing it correctly. I think that goes for any of the arts, whether it's writing or painting or anything that you, and I, I want to be writer. And I think there are times if I'm in a kind of rut and not doing very much, those exercises of write about this bowl or whatever it is, you know, and just start writing something just to get the juices flowing, if you will. And it can sometimes unst uh, make me unstuck and then, um, then a more creative thought will come along and, and be expanded. I think the same can be said for music or any other kind of art. So it sounds like you, it's something you're describing. Yeah, I think that just art in general, I know that this is a very used statement, but art in general is a product of the time and of the person, right? So um, yeah, how do you take that that life experience and turn it into a somewhat tangible item? Yeah. I think about, uh, I, I, because I was talking to Bill Crow and, and really doing a deep dive into that heyday of jazz, where he's talking about going into almost any single jazz club, you know, or going to Birdland in 58, and not only who's on the stage, but who's sitting next to him, you know, you're surrounded by all the jazz greats at that time. And I wonder if it's a lot harder now for musicians in this day and age, um, or is it is it a different way that we're connecting online and did the pandemic help that for us to make a more worldwide connection jazz wise? 
Well, let me first say this, you know, when you were talking about that Bill Crow and the heyday 58 Birdland and everything, it's funny because my thought first thought was like, well, New York's still kind of like that, you know, you can go down to the West Village um, and kind of bounce around to a couple different clubs and see so many incredible artists perform that are either native New Yorkers or in town performing right from all over the place. And you see them walking from place to place because it's such a communal, you know, vibe in New York jazz wise. Um, you know, I, I could think so, have so many times, you know, you know, RIP 55 bar, but there's how many times did I walk from 55 bar over to smalls or something and see like three, you know, giants of jazz on the way there. But I think one of the big things that's changed just music in general, and it trickles down to all styles is the, the connectivity we have now because of things like the internet, um, and how that's kind of changed the atmosphere. You know, I'm I'm not old enough to be able to talk about the great heydays of, you know, New York City, as some people talk about and all that kind of thing. But what I can say is I started playing in New York around 2007, 2008. And even from then to now, the ability to promote yourself online and to um, make music at a much aff more affordable cost or you know there are so many people that have jazz series where they live stream performances out of their lofts apartments in new york or out of wherever they live and and um you know that's something that was just there was no opportunity to do that for artists prior to the change in technology and so you know there's there's like different communities now there's the on the ground at the jazz club late night hanging community there's the social media jazz community you know there are a lot of jazz musicians now that are very popular on social media and are creating content and that's their way of connecting to their audiences um and also with universities and jazz programs all over the country the way they are now i mean i meet people i mean it always used to be like this right charlie parker is from you know kansas city and then you have the west coast players right? you always had people from all over the place contributing to jazz but now i mean at the level that people are playing all over the world, all over the country. I mean, all over the world too, but you know, to stay in the, in the United States education system. I mean, I'm meeting people from all over the place that sound incredible, you know? So. I think as a jazz um, audience member, the big difference between 1958 and, and now of course is the cost. Um, and, you know, my father uh, was a jazz uh, trombonist and, and he was in New York during that late fifties period. And, and as Bill Crow also said, you could go into Birdland and nurse a drink and as much as you could. And, you know, and just really on a very small dime or nickel or whatever it was, you were able to hear some great jazz. And now that is non-existent. And this is why I'm such a huge proponent of the William Jazz concert series is, you know, we don't have to cross a bridge. We don't have to, I sound like David Dempsey, you don't have to, you know, pay for parking. You don't have to, you know, really uh, buy an expensive ticket or a drink minimum. You just get your great, you know, pass or your ticket for William Patterson's programs. And, uh, you know, they're literally five minutes from the library and, and you, it's, phenomenal so yeah I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now but i just don't understand how um more people are taking advantage of the great jazz we have right here in wayne yeah no i mean well you know i'm an advocate for william patterson obviously but uh you know what he says is true you know they put on incredible programming there throughout the year and it's always very affordable and um or free to a lot of people if they fit within you know their students you know and elderly discounts whatever it is practically free um you know, and yeah, they bring, they bring, you know, there's a lot of acts that will come to New York City and line up their performances with William Patterson as well, so that they're coming from other areas of the country, performing in the city, coming out to William Patterson and playing as well. So yeah, they, they're very uh, smart in how they do that. So. so let's talk about your second uh, CD, which is called uh, Yellow Petals. And Jazz Weekly compared uh, your CD that uh, if he wasn't aware of who was playing, he would have thought it was the classic trio of Bill Evans, Paul Boshian, and Scott LaFaro. And that's a great uh, compliment right there, I think. Yes, I, I think that's one of the better compliments. I've, I don't know, Better maybe isn't a great word, but humbling compliments I've ever got because um, I love that group. That is one of my absolute favorite groups ever, so... Were you striving for a sound like that when you were composing, even subconsciously? Yeah, I think in a way I can get around that. I mean, I've 
the reason why I've, I've made two trio albums is because I, I really enjoy and am fascinated and want to just learn more and understand more of the freedom that a trio can create. Uh, and Bill Evans trio amongst other trios um, are one of the groups that's kind of helped to blur a little bit of the line of the roles that those instruments use in a piano trio and the kind of collective music that it can create once those roles are the the boundaries of those roles are kind of broken in a way that's interesting i, I need to think about that more and and uh and listen to your cd and think about that i love the song um orange it, it, i was just very taken with that um especially the intro which you which starts off with with the drums um how did that song come about a while back, I was part of a composition project where we had a visual artist give us each um, two squares that were about, I think, two inch by two inch, maybe three inch by three inch. And she had painted different things on them. And one of the and then our job as composers was to create a piece of music that was inspired by this little three by three square. There were a couple of people that did it and then we performed the music that was all created uh and one of the squares she gave me was had other things on it but was like very orange like very orange and so um it made me think of music that has a kind of south american kind of uh flavor to it so to speak you know i i love brazilian music i love um some of the Caribbean music that I've been exposed to as well. You know, I, I've been very fortunate to work with Cuban and Puerto Rican artists and play a lot of like plena and, and traditional salsa music. And, you know, those rhythms are, you know, wow, right? So that song is based off of a Brazilian rhythm uh, that I also learned about first through some of Maria Schneider's music. And uh, that's that's where it came from. So that's where, that was my basis of that. Of that i started off with the rhythm and then from there i started building and you know i wrote that piece particularly to make sure each of the instruments of the trio was highlighted um like everyone has kind of their own section of that piece it's not written in the traditional way where there's a melody over chords and then you kind of cycle through that and create on top of that but instead there's three distinct sections where each of the instruments in the trio is highlighted are there any musicians that you're um, looking to perform with or would really want to perform with at this day and age? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can give you a list, obviously, right? Everybody uh, wants to perform with their heroes. Uh, I think, I mean, I'll I'll shoot for the stars here. Might as well, right? If we're talking in, you know, in that regard. Um, I love Brad Meldow and his music. If I ever got a chance to play with Brad Meldow, that would be unbelievable. I love the music of Lino Lueke, who's this African guitar player, plays in Herbie Hancock's band, has his own groups and records and stuff, and incredible player. I would love to link up, you know, with him. I mean, I can give you the list of bass players as a drummer that I would love to be able to, you know, play time with. Um, yeah, I'm curious about that. Bass players? uh well i gotta think of the ones that are now still alive right you know i'll start with like the classics like if i ever got a chance to play with ron carter i think that would be incredible i've listened to so many hours of ron carter on records right why not um uh you know uh, bassist like john hebert i love john hebert's playing i i love listening to him with fred hirsch's group and and that uh ruben rogers is a bass player that's you know performing all over the world. I love his playing. I'd love to, I'd love to play with him. Um, uh, Larry Grenadier, who's played with Brad Meldow on, on most of his stuff, you know, incredible bass player. I'd love to play with him. How about keyboardists? Who would you like to play with? Ooh, man. Well, Brad Meldow is a pianist, right? So he definitely fits into that. That's um, a given, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, Jerry Allen, she passed away, but uh, was always a pianist that I I, I would lo love to connect with. Uh, she's, she, yeah, she's amazing. Um, I don't know. I think you're stumping me a little bit with pianist. Fred Hirsch, I love Fred Hirsch's playing, right? Um, uh, Sullivan Fortner, I love Sullivan Fortner's playing. He'd be a great, great person to play with. Uh, I'm a huge Monty Alexander fan, and... Uh... 
bring him up every time I can. So let's mention him. And I love yes. the fact that he, he brings the Jamaican uh, rhythms, which would probably be a lot of fun to, for you to play. Yes, I've seen Monty play a few times. He's, yeah, great, great player. So one of the things that you as a teacher like to impart to your students and hope that they'll carry on in their own playing? There are a couple of sayings that I like to use a lot in my teaching, even if it's not just drum teaching, but maybe classroom teaching as well, is that when you listen to music, there is the what and there is the why. There is the obvious, what is this person playing? Let's transcribe it. Let's figure out what they're doing. Let's try and sound the way they sound on it. But if you don't understand why they're playing what they're playing, then you're losing so much of the music, right? Um, why are these drummers making the choices they're making? Why are they playing the fills they're playing? Why are they playing for the length of time they're playing? Why do they completely change the texture when it gets to this part of the song, you know? Um, so that's one thing that I always, always do. And another thing that was something that I learned from Mulgrew Miller when I was at William Patterson, something he would remind us often is that especially in a music like jazz, but all this goes for everything, listening to the music as just as important of a practice as actually playing the music itself. So he would tell us to make sure that we put in just as much time listening as we do practicing. Um, so those are two, definitely two things I drive home uh, to my students. You really it piqued my interest here when you're talking about the um, the why. So in an example, say uh, Take 5, Dave Brubeck's take, take 5 with Joe Morello, how would you explain the, the what and the why of what he's doing in Take 5? You mean Dave Brubeck's composition in general or Joe Morello on drum? Joe Morello. What, what, what informs his choices and, and how how would you teach that song of to other drummers as to why Joe Morello is choosing to do what he's doing in that song? Well, take five is in 5-4, which is unconventional from most jazz. It's, you know, either in 4-4 four, four, or 3-4. Four. So there are very conventional patterns that we play on 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 four that sound jazzy, so to speak. Um, what Joe Morello did in that song was try and keep that feeling going, but you have to figure out how to do it now in five beats instead of four. So he kind of opened up the middle of the bar and put the skip pattern of the spangalang, as we say in jazz, more towards the end on that fifth beat of the song. And then that now became the basis of the rhythm of how he plays everything else around it, or at least how I see it. I can't speak for Joe Morello, but um so I would first get my student to understand that that is now your new basis, core rhythm, as I would call it, right? This is our core rhythm. This is how we're going to feel the five. Then from that, we can listen to how does he play variations on it, right? What things does he change off of that basis? And then there's the famous solo in that song, right? Where he plays these sometimes very long ideas with long periods of time where he doesn't play in between. You know, I can think of the one. So, you know, right. So he leaves all this space. So why is he doing that? Well, I don't know. But what it does do is it allows him to insert these ideas in different parts of that five feeling. I think that's what he was trying to accomplish. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, shuffles, if you will. Um, I'm a big fan of Bernard Purdy. And yeah. the, the, the Purdy shuffle there is uh, world famous. Um, and he'll be the first one to tell you. <laughs> so how does a drummer... Um, fall into a shuffle? Is it the feel of the music or can they create their own shuffles? Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, there are different types of shuffles, right? You have like, if you think of the 1950s kind of rock shuffle, it has a certain vibe to it. If you think of the Bernard Purdy, you know, a little funkier, definitely super triplety, you know, very similar to like the Jeff Picaro, uh, Rosanna shuffle, you know, they're very similar. Uh, but all shuffles are really kind of built off of the 12, eight or triplety feel. Right. So it's really kind of putting an emphasis on the very first and the very last partial of how you feel the three beats in those. So it, what it, in my opinion, creates a little bit more of a forward motion to the music. There's there's like this push and drop, push and drop, push and drop, which I, if I understand it correctly, was very much in line with the way dancing happened in, in the time that, that shuffles became popularized in American blues and rock and roll. Uh, and then, you, then used moving forward. But uh, it's always about creating 
this forward movement or at least this feeling of forward movement in the time feel that if you're going to play more of a straight eighth kind of like ringo -y rock beat um you're kind of get a little bit more of a streamline and less of a heavier where each beat kind of lands feeling thank you that was a great explanation i, I would love to sit in a one of your classes and learn more <laughs> So um, let's talk about your last uh, CD to come out, which was Two Sided Truth in 2017. Um, and that was your trio as well? Yes. So um, have any favorite songs on that that you uh, would like to talk about? Yeah, I, I um, a couple of the songs on that record are pretty near and dear to me. Uh, the song Two Sided Truth, um, you know, I, I, I love African rhythms. I, I've, you know, uh, I, by no means am I a guru of African music or anything, but I've spent time listening and transcribing and playing, or at least trying to play djembe and, you know, other drums and, and, and immerse myself in some of that music. Because as I talked about earlier, the, the rhythmic concepts that I find in some of those musics is just fascinating to me and the feeling and the way that they, they, you know, uh, when I say they, I mean like, um, these recordings I've heard of groups, you know, the way they naturally play those rhythms is just amazing to me uh so that song is is based off of from a from a rhythmic standpoint based off of my african uh, likings but the the kind of concept behind the song comes from uh i had a period where i read a lot of herman hesse's book the german composer i mean a uh, writer and in his famous book siddhartha there is this point towards the end of the story where there's a line forgive me for forgetting exactly the wording of it but it's the concept is every story has two sides that are equally as true and uh, man when i read that line it was like like i just sat on it for a while and like really like what does he mean by this why in the context of the story like what is the meaning of it and at the time that i was reading that i was also writing this piece and so the two kind of thought processes combined and i tried to write the piece in two halves to represent the two sides of the truth um that's how that song kind of came to be. So yeah, it's a little bit of a, a quote from from Herman Hess uh, with African rhythms. Well, the librarian here likes the fact that you're referencing uh, his his great writing. <laughs> well, I really am thrilled to have had the opportunity to talk with you today, and um, I know we can all look forward to hopefully seeing you up at William Patterson. It was the uh, fall jazz series starts. Uh, stay tuned, and and there will be after this interview, you'll see John's. Uh, website as well as the cds that we talked about so thank you for joining me today i really appreciate it thank you so much for the conversation mm -hmm.